This is the New American Media. Broadcasting to you live from the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, planet Earth, North America, the United States of America, California, Los Angeles. To be specific, hello everybody, this is Brian Engelman and you're listening to the Unhappy Hour special Cleveland Browns season opener preview show. Thanks for joining us. If you're listening live, that would be thenewamericanmedia.com. You click that little TNAM radio icon on the middle right side of the page, the big flag. You can listen live, of course. After the fact, we embed all of the shows. So do us a favor, check out the homepage, thenewamericanmedia.com. Subscribe to youtube.com slash the new American media. <clears throat> Follow us on Twitter at American underscore media underscore and search the new American media on Facebook and like our page. It's game time. So here we are. Here we are. It's a fantastic time to be a sports fan, especially when your favorite baseball team is in contention. So the Cleveland Indians are two games back, I believe, as of as of the airing of this this segment. And so they're in the playoff hunt playing better baseball, trying to catch up, get one of those wild card spots. Ohio State Buckeyes 1-0, playing again a little later today against San Diego State. That'll be fun. And this is our preview show for the Cleveland Browns. So we're going to bring in special guest Brandon Odell. Brandon usually joins us when it comes time for football-related matters. Long-time season ticket holder, ticket holder. Brandon and I used to do a lot of college radio back at the Bowling Green State University. <laughs> There's no the in our name. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyway, let's just get him on the horn, talk some Browns. Brandon Odell, welcome back to the Unhappy Hour. You're live on the air, sir. How you doing today? I'm uh, doing good. How about you? Uh, you know, I'm uh, living the dream. Of course, can't complain. It's it's football season, man. Let me let me ask you this, because I need I need a reporter over in Ohio. Does it feel like fall right now, or is it still like the tail end of summer? Is it hotter, or is are the leaves starting to turn and you can smell it in the air? What is it? Um. Well, the nights. So we have had some nights that are getting a bit cooler. Um, today is. Uh, it's still pretty warm, um, but uh, we have had some days where the regular temperatures have been in the 70s, but that was this week. The The week before, uh, it was pretty much in the 90s every single day. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, the early fall temperatures where you'll have uh, the, the variance uh, up and down of about 30 or 40 degrees just in a single day, We've definitely been starting to see those. So I guess in that respect, it is starting to feel a little bit like fall. But to be completely honest, uh, the only leaves that are turning right now are turning because of the fact that we've uh, been in a little bit of a drought lately, and so the leaves are just kind of dying off prematurely. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, you know, on our, on our Facebook page, someone said, who is ready for fall leaves, hoodies, pumpkins, and s'mores? You know, I, we're probably a few weeks away from that, but, I mean, it's been hot out here in Los Angeles. It usually gets hot out here in September, October. Uh, the, the, maybe August, September, October. They're the three hottest months out here. So, But, anyway, I always equate football with the change of the seasons, you know, the, the turning into fall. And it's just a great time to be alive. Buckeyes are 1-0. Indians are in the hunt for the playoffs. And, you know, we're here today basically to, to talk about the Cleveland Browns and their matchup against the Dolphins. I've, I've been hearing some injury woes. I don't know if we want to start on a high note and work to the injuries or start with the injuries and work to uh, some, some key matchups. What are you, what are you thinking today? Uh, well, you're the boss, so you uh, start somewhere and I'll follow. Well, obvious, obviously, Burkavius Mingo. Let, let, let's start with our first draft pick. Still a bruised lung. They've officially ruled him out. Uh, you know, I, this, this bugs me because when you draft a player in the first round in the top, what, top five, top six – you need that player to produce, and when you hear something weird like bruised lung, I mean, that almost sounds like Lou Gehrig's disease or, 
I, I don't know, like like something so rare, you go, oh man, did we draft somebody that's going to have such a condition where he's never going to take the field? I don't, I don't know. I mean, what, what's your gut telling you with the Mingo injury? Do you think it's something? It's just extra precautionary, or is this this really a warning sign? Uh, that th- there may be something wrong with this first round draft pick that may never take the field for the Browns. Um, well, you know, I mean, I think it's too early to make any real judgments. Um, you know, it was a freakish kind of thing, and uh, a freakish kind of thing can happen to just about anyone. It doesn't just have to be a first round draft pick. So, you know, um, we'll just uh, basically, I'm I'm not getting too concerned with things. Most signs are pointing towards the fact that they want him that that they're looking at him possibly being ready to return to the field for week two. Um, you know, I would be far more concerned if we were talking about something as far as from a football standpoint, uh, because obviously no matter what, his injury is very concerning because it has to do with a vital organ. But um, as far as his status for football, I'd be far more concerned if we were seeing some of the, uh, you know, the Monterio Hardesty type injuries with the ACL, the knees, the ankles, um, you know, those kinds of things. So, you know, the, the next couple of weeks, if it's something where he's, uh, he comes back in there and he's ready to play and he, is, he still gives us, uh, you know, 14 or 15 uh, games, uh, you know, through the season here, I, I think that, um, you know, you could kind of consider it to be sort of a case-closed kind of a thing. But, you know, if it is something that ends up being a chronic thing, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's no use in, in allowing yourself to get that frustrated by it because of the fact that it was something that absolutely no one could have foreseen. You know, if it was something where he was having, you know, you look at Monterio Hardesty, had uh, knee issues uh, in college, uh, you know, there was nothing like that on uh, Barkevius Mingo's uh, resume. So, I mean, no one could have seen this coming, so you just basically roll with the punches and and kind of uh, see where it goes. But uh, to answer your question, no, I'm not getting too bent out of shape just yet. It's only one game with uh, the bevy of, of season-ending injuries that have occurred to you know pretty decent players throughout the NFL already. Um, losing your top draft pick for just a game or two doesn't really rank very high on that list. No, and I'll, I'll give you that. That's a, that's a fair assessment. It, it just kind of reminds me of the hopes when you bring in a LaCharles Bentley. What was that, 2005, 2006? You know, you bring him in, first play in scrimmage, blows out his ACL, never plays for the team. And you're just like, ugh. You know, so I'm just hoping it's not that. But on the on the other side, you have you have Ataba Rubin and Buster Screen. They're questionable with some injuries. Any any thoughts there? Um, well, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not really too sure what to make of it. Uh, uh, both uh, injuries uh, were, were new, uh, so, you know, surprises that uh, the, uh, the media and the fans didn't know about until yesterday. So... You know, I mean, I guess that's uh, one of those just kind of uh, wait-and-see kind of things. Uh, Joe Hayden responded just by saying, well, hey, if Buster can't go, it's the next man up. Yeah. Which uh, the the problem there is I don't know who that next man is, being that we uh, are going into the season with a surprisingly small amount of corners. Only uh, only have four corners on the uh, on the roster right now. And considering the fact that, you know, you're, one of them may be out, uh, you have very little option when it comes to going to your dime packages and stuff like that. Although they do say that Jonathan Batamosi, you know, uh, is switching this season from being a corner to playing safety, and so they, I think they almost consider him as a fifth corner a little bit as well. Yeah, they're saying he'll be replaced by Chris Owens. So, you know, yeah. if I, I don't know. I, I really wish that, that we could have could have added a piece – there I mean we went out we got Paul Kruger you know on on the on the defensive you know as, as a linebacker then you, then you went out and, and and got some help on the defensive line as well as drafting really deep on the D-line last year you just kind of look that that the DBs you know you, you got Hayden um I don't know I mean I mean we'll see but but it, it sure seems like the Dolphins are going to be throwing the ball a lot more than running it um I don't know what what, what do you what do you expecting to see let's just stick with the Browns defense what are you expecting to see from the Miami Dolphins offense and do you think that it matches up well with Mike Wallace and who they have over there with the second year quarterback as well in Tannehill I mean it's really hard to say I mean it's the first game of the season so even just looking at anything that you saw in preseason uh, so often the, the things that you saw in the preseason really were 
were illusory just for the simple fact that you know, teams didn't want to show their hands, so to speak, until the regular season starts. So um, a, a lot of the same things that you've uh, seen from Brandon Whedon in the preseason you saw from Ryan Tannehill. Uh, high completion percentage, uh, high QBR, um, threw for uh, three touchdowns, the same as Brandon Whedon. Uh, so, uh, I mean, obviously – he uh, he could come out firing at all cylinders. Uh, talking about Ryan Tannehill, but uh, you know it's it's also a distinct possibility that uh, that he has a rough outing because he is still a young player and uh, and he is you know truthfully speaking as unproven and uncertain as uh, as Brandon Wheaton is as far as you know you don't really know if you have a sure thing yet. Uh, so um, it's kind of uh, going to just be interesting, and I think uh, I mean he still has uh, to be able to. Do timing with uh, with Mike Wallace, and that's something that doesn't just happen overnight. Um, early reports in Miami uh, camp have been that he and Mike Wallace haven't necessarily looked quite as sharp uh, with one another, and in fact, uh, which has been the case for the last several years now, uh, Ryan Tannehill's favorite target is Brian Hartline. Uh, Brian Hartline, uh, obviously a former Ohio State uh, standout, uh, never really was truly thought of as being just this great go-to guy at Ohio State, though. Uh, but it's uh, carved a pretty solid career for himself so far out there in Miami. Um, last year, had over 1,000 yards receiving, uh, including, uh, interestingly enough, one game where he, uh, I believe it was uh, Ryan Tannehill, threw for 420 yards uh, and uh, a couple of scores against uh, Ray Horton's Arizona Cardinals defense, and uh, Brian Hartline actually had something like 13 catches for 250 yards that day. Well, that'd be a good week to start him on your fantasy team. <laughs> uh, uh, that uh, that it would, that it would. So, but uh, but either way, the the point uh, is is that Brian Hartline uh, could end up being a bigger factor in this game than Mike Wallace. Uh, and uh, you know they lost Reggie Bush. Uh, Reggie Bush is now a Detroit Lion. Uh, so now they're going to try to rely more heavily on last year's fourth-round pick, uh, Lamar Miller, out of the University of Miami, um, supposedly kind of a poor man's Edger and James. So uh, I think that uh, the, the plan is to see uh, what the Dolphins have in their hometown boy there. How much of an impact do you think Paul Kruger is going to make? You know, Because that was one of the big splashes that the Browns made early on in free agency. Do you And... and, and, and on top of it, you can look at how torched the the Baltimore Ravens defense was. Just picked apart. Obviously, Peyton Manning, a great quarterback, but that Dolph or, or that that Ravens defense did not look the same. Do you expect Paul Kruger to come over here and make a pretty strong impact, or just be a solid player? Um, I mean, you hope he's going to make a good impact. But once again, until you really see these guys out there on the field in a regular season game playing together, playing in Ray Horton's schemes that he has put together for these guys, it's so hard to truly say what you're really going to get. You know, there's other players on the team, you really kind of know what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get from Joe Hayden. You know what you're going to get from Dequel Jackson. But, um, you know, both of those players have, uh, have played together for a few years. They're not switching teams. Uh, and uh, I think ultimately... Dequell Jackson's job is still going to be to make tackles, and Joe Hayden's job is going to be to, to cover the team's number one guy. They both really know what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, Paul Kruger's coming into a new situation. He's now a full-time starter rather than kind of a situational edge rusher. Uh, obviously, edge rushing is going to be his uh, number one goal, but uh, let's face it, he needs to be strong against the run as well, and uh, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see uh, what we get out of him. But uh, like I said, it's just really hard to to really try to just make a, a estimated or just estimate how good a player is going to be when uh, when they've not actually gotten out there in a regular season game for you yet. No, that is that is true. And and you know what we are thankfully getting this year. You know, despite Barkevius Mingo being injured. We do have second year Whedon looking a lot better than at least in preseason. You know, it's not a real game; it doesn't count. But but he's looking a lot better than he did last year. Trent Richardson, he's healthy. Yeah, he wasn't healthy last year. You know, he had lingering problems in preseason, and then he had the rib issue during the middle of the season. He still had a really good year. So 
Just on the other side, what do you? I, I know we're not going to know when, un, until the players take the field, but I have pretty strong expectations from the offense. I, I really think uh, with, with with Joe Thomas, with Alex Mack, with Mitchell Schwartz, with with Josh Gordon, with Brandon Whedon and Trent Richardson, I really think that offense can do some stuff, especially under Norv Turner. Do you do, uh, do you have equal optimism there, or is it is it once again just another wait and see kind of thing? Because I, I think Trent Richardson is really ready to have a breakout year this year. Well, uh, I certainly hope so, and uh, and I agree. I'm I'm feeling very optimistic about the offense. Um, you know, uh, the let's let's face it, the loss of Josh Gordon for the first two games of the season uh, is one that hurt. Uh, but if you're going to be able to absorb something. Uh, be it your, it, you're always better to absorb injuries um, for earlier in the season before a lot of the other guys have started getting banged up as well. So, you know, you have the full complement of the rest of your offensive weapons. Uh, I think the plan is certainly to rely very heavily on Trent Richardson for the first few weeks. And I think that uh, right now he's ready for the challenge. Uh, he seems like he is just absolutely chomping at the bit and ready to get out there. And uh, and show why this team drafted him third overall in in 2012. Um, I I for one, and obviously it seems like you feel the same way. Think that he is poised for a for a good season, and uh, I think that uh, he is going to be the one. If, if this game is going to be won or lost tomorrow, it is going to be won or lost uh, due to the legs of Trent Richardson. And you know you've 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 been in the season ticket club with, with your, with your family for a long time. Is this one that you're going to be going to? Do you have uh, figured out which ones you're going to be are on the field correspondence with? Uh, well, uh, my, my father in the stands, is, uh, maybe. Is, going to, is going to this football game. Uh, so, uh, I'll be, uh, actually going, uh, the first game that I will be going to is the, uh, Thursday night game again. Ooh. Uh, the, uh, Buffalo bills, uh, in, uh, the first weekend of October, uh, first, uh, Thursday in October, I should say. Oh, that could be pretty fun. Yeah, I'm I, I like those Thursday night games. So, I, I mean, let, let's just let's just break it down then. Uh, against the Dolphins, Dolphins didn't have a great year last year. Neither did the Browns. I, I look I look around, and and it sure seems to me that the Browns made quite a few improvements in the off season. And I'm wondering, I got to get your predictions now. So let, let's call it. Like, put it on the line. What, what's the score going to be for this one? B. Uh, well, my whole thing is is the fact that I mean they can't, they just simply can't keep losing openers every single year. So at some point, they they are bound to win one. You know, it's it, it's just uh, it, it's just got to happen. <clears throat> and at some point, they're they're bound to have a game uh, where they actually you know, really put it together for four quarters. And I, I don't know. I just I have a feeling that. This is very optimistic for you. We've done this. What year are we on now, Brandon? Doing this is this year three or year two? Since uh, you've been coming, uh, out? three maybe. Yeah, I, th- I think I think as we started, what was it? Maybe April, May of t- what would that be two and a half years ago. So, yeah, I mean, this might be our third football season. This is a very optimistic Brandon Odell that that I'm hearing right now. I like this, and I even like how you're painting the picture. We're gonna jump out to that early lead. I like this. I'm gonna go thirty-eight seventeen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to go 33-24. Uh, 
That, that, that's what I'm thinking. I, I think we're going to get a couple of touchdowns, plenty of touchdowns. Uh, you know, oh, real, real quick, though, now, now it's got me thinking. How do you feel about this kicking game now that Phil Dawson is gone? Are, are you concerned about this? or? Well, if you're thinking about them getting up to 33 points, you're planning on them kicking a, a heck of a lot of field goals, so I guess you must be feeling pretty good about them. Uh, I'm thinking five touchdowns and a field goal, so I'm feeling uh, a little bit less... Uh, um, truly uh, excited about Billy Cundiff, but let's face it, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and I, I loved Phil Dawson, everyone in Cleveland did, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that we haven't won uh, very, very, we haven't won many games because of Phil Dawson uh, in his career. Uh, frankly speaking, if we win football games, it's uh, in spite of Phil Dawson. It's because of the fact that <laughs> the team in other areas is uh, able to put it together. So, yeah, you know, you know what, you, know, you, you got me thinking there. I'm, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna retract. I'm going 34. I'm saying two field goals. I, I, I thought that one through. I, I appreciate the wisdom on that. I'm, I, I rethought it. 34 to 24. Yeah, I. That, well, I mean, Phil Dawson. Don't forget back, back in the day. What was that when we were in that in that playoff run? What, how, how many wins did we have, and we still missed the playoffs by a half game or something? Um, I mean, he's the, seven. Yeah, that, that that double bounce against Baltimore, and I mean, I've seen Dawson do some so, some solid stuff, and it's just been so long since I've thought of the kicking game as a question mark. Is what I'm getting at. I can't remember how long it's been since the kicking game was a like up in the air for me. It's usually pretty consistent. Well, I guess it would have been 2009 when uh, Phil Dawson was injured for five or six weeks, and Billy Cundiff had to fill in. Well. We're gonna see how it plays out. I yeah, I I, might, I, <laughs> I I I'm more comfortable with four touchdowns and two field goals as opposed to a whole bunch of field goals. But yeah, I, I I'm confident too. And I even saw Skip Bayless and you know everybody on on first take. They're picking the Browns. How long has it been since people are actually picking the? I, I know I know that we're playing the Dolphins, but people are still picking the Browns. Other people see the the, the progress as well. When was the last? Well, let, let me ask you this, Brandon, and, and and we're pretty much just about done here. When was the last time you could feel like the surging optimism? And and I guess I don't want to put those words in your mouth, but are you feeling like you think that this is the year they put it together and take that step? Do you feel like that's the general consensus among your friends, the media, and the other people that you're encountering on a daily basis? Do you feel that most people tend to think that the Browns are moving in the right direction? Um, honestly, I think it's pretty mixed, uh, just because of the fact that, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen the new regimes come in, and, uh, you know, everyone optimistic that this is the regime that's going to change things. And, uh, unfortunately, none of them have been able to do that. So, <laughs> you know, I really think that it's, uh, that it's some of these players uh, that, uh, you know, have been uh, rookies and second-year players over the last couple of years that, you know, have been solid upper round picks that are all starting for the team. And, I, and honestly, that's my number one reason for optimism right now. <laughs> you have Brandon Weed, obviously Josh Gordon not available right now, but you have Josh Gordon, uh, second round or a first, a second round pick starting on one side. You have uh, Greg Little, a second round pick starting on the other side. You have a first round pick behind center. You have a first round pick uh, at tailback. Uh, you have uh, a second round pick. Uh, at uh, one linebacker spot uh, in uh, Jamal Sheard. You have a first-round pick in, when Mingo comes back at the other linebacker spot. You have a first-round pick at uh, in Phil Taylor in the middle. You have a first-round pick in Joe Hayden on the outside. You know, we, we we're hitting on a lot of these early picks that Joe Thomas. for a long time we weren't hitting on. You know, you think about Courtney Brown. Uh, his career lasted only a few years. You know, so, I mean, some of these players – People are, I mean, Brian Robisky, uh, 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 Muhammad Nassiqua, you know, oh, so many of these players just couldn't stay on the field and weren't showing consistency. And I think some of these players that you're seeing the Browns have uh, brought in in the last few years uh, through the draft are, are really starting to stick. So that in itself is my number one reason for optimism because if you want to talk about what the number one thing that has always separated us from the Ravens, the Steelers, and, and even the Bengals, is the ability to really produce your own homegrown talent. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that we've missed on too many first-round draft picks over the last decade. And uh, it seems like in the last three or four years, 
uh, that some of them are finally really starting to stick. I, you know, you made a very compelling argument right there. I, I think you'd make a great defense attorney. That 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 really. I don't. I don't know that I've really heard it articulated that well in a while. And and we're talking the past two, three, three years or so. Go back even a few more. Joe Thomas has been an anchor, looking around on a sinking ship for a long time, and now you look at all of the players that are stepping up around him through the draft. And yeah, I, I think there is reason for optimism. So, you know, let go Browns, Brandon. I I have been waiting for this for so long, and I really feel as though I have paid my dues. Uh, to, to paraphrase Queen, I, I feel like I've paid my dues with all of the misery. Enough is enough. I'm ready for the playoffs. You know, I I, I, I have unrealistic expectations every year. You know this. I, I, I predict undefeated Super Bowl season every season. And, hey, you know, until it's until it's proven wrong, why shouldn't I think big? If you're not thinking big, why are you thinking? I don't the problem know. with that is it's proven wrong usually after <laughs> week one every year. <laughs> Well, yeah. What, what are we one in? What it was it? One in twelve? One in thirteen? In the I, I forget yep. exactly. Last time we, it's been about a decade since the last time we won. So we're like I said, we're due. We've just we're bound yeah. to win. We've had too many close calls the last few years. We're bound to win one, and uh, you know that's why I'm just kind of saying they're going to come out and, and just really take care of business, and and the game is uh, is going to be uh, a little bit uh, further away than maybe even a lot of people think. So. Uh, that, uh, that you know, that this is where all of my gut instincts are, t- are going. Right and for now. the fans, Brandon, for the fans, to start the season off, amped for a season, you're tailgating, you know, you've paid money for this, you've taken the whole day off, you're used to being let down, but you always have that eternal optimism that maybe this year is the year to come out in front of your hometown fans in the first game and actually punch your opponent in the mouth, knock them down, take the title, and, and, and just... Show show the fans like we can do this. Like I, I think it really does set the tone, the tempo for the season. There's no more close is good enough. And hey, we made some progress out there. And well, well, you know, we're we're, we're learning from our mistake. No, no, no. Go out and win. That's your job. Just win. I don't want any excuses. I just want wins. And I and I'm predicting one for tomorrow. So tell you what, man, we'll we'll have to we'll have to recap what occurred. I don't know if we might be able to do that sometime earlier in the week if there's any time um you know some sometime like maybe on a on a monday or tuesday earlier in the week to kind of go over what just happened and preview the next game instead of wait until friday but we'll talk off air see if that might work for you but either way this is strictly browns this is the unhappy hour and one of these days it's going to be a happy hour so go browns brandon thanks for joining us again we always appreciate your Insight and really, like I said, the way that you summed up all those draft picks went, went you, you didn't stop rattling off draft picks for about 30 seconds. And I went, Wow, we do have something going on here, something good is going on in Cleveland. And it took you saying it for me to really uh, understand it. So, thanks for joining us, B. All right, well, you know, just think about this. I mean, in 2004, 2005. You know, uh, we weren't hitting on any of those guys. And then you go to, like, 2007 and uh, the players that, uh, I mean, even like Brady Quinn uh, was a, was a guy that everybody thought was going to be so good. So, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's about time that, uh, that we hit on some of these draft picks the way that we have. And, uh, and they've been turned into solid, consistent players, uh, upper-tier players at their position. Uh, and uh, and it, it's going in the right direction. I really do feel that way. Absolutely. I even picked up Josh. I even picked up Josh Gordon in one of my fantasy leagues, and I even put Brandon Whedon on the bench because I really liked what I saw from him in Game One and Game Two, and figured if he comes out and lights up the Dolphins, he's going to get snapped up on the waiver wire. I'm just going to grab him, well, put him on the bench, and see what happens. Well, I got to say, anybody that had Peyton Manning uh, starting as their <laughs> fantasy quarterback did okay for themselves. I was fortunate enough to uh, my uh, my number one receiver is uh, Demarius Thomas uh, from Denver Broncos. From yeah, Denver I got him Broncos. too. I uh, got some good points off of him, no doubt. Yeah, it's it's fantasy is such a black. Maybe next year we can find a way to get you into our league, or maybe I could jump into your league because I I have three leagues going on right now. It's kind of crazy, but it's a lot of fun. It really forces you to pay attention to every game going on, and it really engages you in the football process um, more so than just watching the Browns and rooting for the Browns. You, why the heck am I watching the the Arizona Cardinals defense? Why do I want this no name kicker? To, to, to get me a few it's it, it's kind of fun it's kind of ridiculous but it's a lot of fun and thankfully I wasn't going up against Peyton Manning this week because you know in fantasy yeah. football it just takes one wacky week 
and there's nothing you can do to defeat your opponent. So that that's the other roll of the dice that makes it fun. But yeah, man, like I said, maybe maybe, maybe something earlier in the week, maybe Monday, Tuesday, we'll talk off air, see if we can do a quick recap instead of waiting to the end of the week when we've forgotten about it. Trying to change that up a little bit here on the format. But hey, man, go Browns. Have a have a good time and enjoy being in Ohio for the game because I got to get up at what nine o'clock to get to get a seat at the bar at ten. So, uh, yeah, enjoy the fact that you actually get to sleep in a little bit. It, I, I do kind of miss that. <laughs> well, sleeping in the one-year-old is uh, about 6.30, so that, <laughs> that doesn't really well you, well, you also are a school teacher, so sleeping in is normally 6.30 anyway. But, you know, fair yeah. enough. I'll, I'll give you that. But, hey, man, go Browns. Thanks for joining us again. Appreciate your time, Brandon. Go Browns. All right, that was Brandon O'Dell, everybody. It is Browns time. Ready to rock and roll. So excited. <laughs> yeah, the funniest thing on radio to say is, can't even put it into words. Well, then why are you doing radio? It is pretty much my favorite time of year. And I've, I've said this before, I just love the turning of the seasons. I just, I, I love the bonfires. I love the smell when it gets cold. I love seeing your breath. <clears throat> I've, I've played football. I, I love the battle. I love the strategy. I love the camaraderie the tailgating, the food, everything about this time of year is just my favorite. Love it. Love it. So special thanks to Brandon Odell for joining us. Special thanks to you for checking out the program. Go Browns. I want to quickly remind you that you need to follow us. If you just love our Cleveland Brown stuff, that's cool. Put up with our politics because we do tons of that on our Agree to Disagree show. Try to keep most of that out of here. Tolerate us with the other stuff and check us out. On Twitter, follow us. We're at American underscore media underscore. At American underscore media underscore. Search The New American Media on Facebook and like the page. Subscribe to YouTube.com slash The New American Media. And check out the homepage, TheNewAmericanMedia.com. Signing out from Los Angeles on this Strictly Browns segment of the Unhappy Hour. My name's Brian Engelman. And I've approved this message. You are listening to the New American Media.